Jesus. But you are my God. But you are enough. Jesus. Oh, Jesus.
Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
church, let's praise him one more time. And all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing great. Come on, church. Let's worship him. Just sing a new song to him tonight. We worship you, Jesus. Oh, you're great, oh God. You're great in this place, oh God. We worship you, Lord. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, you're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're great, Lord. You're greatly to be praised in this place. We exalt you tonight. We lift our praises to you tonight, Lord, because you alone are worthy. You are a good, good God. You're a good Father. Your promises are yes and amen. You will never let us down. Love that verse a minute ago. You will never, ever, ever let us down. There ain't nobody else can say that but you. And I appreciate that. And I thank you that we know that we can trust you because you cannot lie. And you will never let us down, Lord. I praise you for your anointing, your presence in this place. God, I pray that we'll receive that word tonight, that you will never let us down. You will never forsake us. You said it in your word. I will never leave you or forsake you. Hallelujah. I'll stick closer to you than a brother. Thank you, Jesus, for that promise. Thank you for sending your precious Holy Spirit to help us, to lead God and direct us in all truth. Thank you for your anointing on these songs tonight and on these voices tonight. We worship you. We love you. We ask you to continue to move by your spirit. Thank you for the word that's going to be preached tonight. And the very last verse says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And Lord, I pray for a quickening in our spiritual ears tonight, that we will hear what you are saying to our church. And if there's areas in our church that we need to tighten up, and 
we need to straighten up and we need to wake up. God, that you would help us and allow us to see it tonight in the spirit realm, Lord, so that we'll be the church that you have called us to be. We love you and we give you praise for it in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. Hallelujah. You can sit down if you can. I don't know about out there, but it's pretty thick up here. Hallelujah. If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, you guys know that we've been talking about, um, we've talked about four of the churches. We talked about the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Tyathira. And last couple of weeks we've been talking about in the church of Tyathira, they allowed a Jezebel spirit to be there. And we talked about that, how to deal with that. And, and I, I learned so much through that study. But tonight we're going to talk about the fifth church, and it's the church of Sardis. And I want you to understand that this, these letters was written to these churches that Paul had started. And Jesus commanded John, who was on the Isle of Patmos, to write these letters. It would be no different than Jesus commanding someone in Lincolnton to write letters to our church and First Baptist and First Methodist or whoever. These churches was written to these cities, to these churches that were going on. And um, tonight... I think we're going to learn a few things, and uh, I think that, that God wants to speak some things to us. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, and we're going to start. And he says here again, here is what I command you to write to the church of Sardis. He commanded John to write this. He was serious about them receiving this letter uh, of correction and warning. He said, here are the words of Jesus who holds the seven spirits of God, who has the seven stars in his hand, he says. Now this says it's from Jesus, right? It's the revelation from Jesus to John. That's what revelation means. I used to call it the revelations. And Dan Miller came up to me one time and said, that's not what it, what it says. It says revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John to give to the churches. Okay, And he says this, in every single church, he uses this sentence right here. He says, I know what you are doing. Every single church, he says, I know what you're doing. We talked about it Sunday morning. God knows everything. He sees everything and he hears everything. And he knows what the church is doing. He knows what our church is doing. He knows if we're striving to be the church we're supposed to be. And he knows that we're just going through the motions. Amen. Y'all help me out just a little bit. I might preach for you if you do. He says, listen to this sentence right here. He says, uh, first of all, he says, I know what you're doing. He said, people think that you are alive, but you are dead. Wow. Can you imagine me standing up on a Sunday morning and, and, and God giving us a letter, Jesus giving us a letter and saying, read this to the church. And I'm standing up and I'm saying, how you doing? Everybody doing good today? I've got a letter from the Lord I'm going to read to you. And this is what he says. He says, I know what you're doing. He says, people think that you're alive, but you're dead. I wonder what the church thought. What would you think? And man, as I begin to, to, to meditate on that sentence right there, he says, you or people think that you're alive. There's people that look at churches, and, and he's writing to the church. He's not writing to the world. He's writing to the church. And there's people that look at churches, and they think because they do a few good things, and they go here, they do this, or they do that, that they're alive. And people thought that this church was alive, but Jesus said, you're dead. I don't know about you, well, I do know about you, and I know about me. I don't want Jesus to say that about me. Well, yeah, New Vision, you do a few good things, you do this and you do that, and people around the community think that you're alive, New Vision. They come to your church, they hear your awesome worship, they hear your preacher, and they leave, and they think you're alive, but I say you're dead. I would never want to hear Jesus say that. But he's saying that to this fifth church here, the Church of Smyrna. He's telling them, People around this community, people in the city, they was one of the capitals of the old city of, of Libya. Uh, he says, people in this city think that this church is alive, but you're really dead. Now, is that not a wake-up call? I mean, good gracious. He said, everybody around here thinks you're alive, but I say you're dead. Who does it matter? Who does it matter what's, what, what is said about us, people or Jesus? 
Listen, everybody in this community can think New Vision is the best church since peanut butter, but if Jesus don't think it, we ain't nothing. Amen? We've got to understand that. And then he goes on and he says this. Wake up. My dad used to come in our room. Me and John. Now this is back before, before I had Allison. You would almost have to come and hit me in the head with a two by four to wake me up. I slept so solid and so sound. And it's so amazing that as soon as we had her, every little bitty thing I heard, I jumped up. To check and see if she's okay. I mean, I ain't saying I'm the one who took care of her because Glenna did. I ain't going to sit here and lie, am I? But I'd say, Glenna, you need to wake up. Allison's crying or something. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but it's wild how your instincts, the, the instincts that God gives you, the parental instincts kick in. And some of you know, you, I see you smiling. You know what I'm talking about. As soon as I had Allison, I woke up at the least little thing. If I heard a little bitty squeak, I woke up to check on her. And I've been cursed like that ever since. I'm like that now. I'm a very light sleeper. Unless I'm just war slam out. And then I don't even hear myself snoring. But he says, wake up. My dad used to walk, walk in and me and John, be, we'd be sound asleep. And dad would say, this is crazy. He'd say, up, up, up. That's what he'd do. If John was here, he'd be shaking his head. he said, up, up, up. Three times. And if you didn't get up, up, up. Then you got lectured. He would never spank us. My dad set us down and lectured us and prayed for us. But Jesus is saying, wake up. He's telling the church to wake up. And sometimes I come into the sanctuary and, and I want to just grab people and say, wake up. Are you crazy? Look at what the devil's doing to your family. Look at how the devil's using you. And you think you're alive, but you're dead. And then I see people that call themselves a Christian. Oh, they'll put it all over Facebook and Instagram and everything. They call themselves a Christian and they're shacking up, living in sin. Doing all this crazy stuff. Living in full-blown sin. And, and you know it and I know it, but they won't admit it. And according to the scripture, the Bible says they're going to hell. And they think they're alive in Christ. They think because some preacher prayed over them at an the altar and they repented of their sin. They said they repented. And then they got up and they lived the same old way that they're going to go to heaven. And the Bible says they're going to bust hell out open. Wake up, church. Amen. It's what the word of God says. You know why Jesus wrote this letter to that church? Because he loved that church. Jesus loves the church and he loved all seven of them. He loved them enough to send John to the Isle of Patmos to get him by himself where he could speak to him. And said, John, I command you to write this stuff. The problem is not many preachers are willing to preach the truth. They're not. I know this is Wednesday night. And I'm going straight through. Return to your first love. So don't think I'm throwing stuff in there. But this is the truth. He said, wake up. He's talking to the church. Wake up. And sometimes I know some of you, we're learning about our different ways we feel God and hear from God. And, and I'm evidently a feeler. And I've been in here and I felt before like, wake up, people. My goodness, wake up. We serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. You walk around all muddy, grub, all Frown face and pickle face and mad and busted, disgusting, can't be trusted. And we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. What's wrong with you? Man, boy, them, them cupcakes was good. They got me jacked up. Hallelujah. I told you I was going to preach crazy tonight. And then he goes on. Listen to what he says, man. He says, wake up. And then he says, strengthen what is left, or it will die. They had a little bit of stuff going on that was right, and he says, strengthen that, or it's going to die too. The whole place is going to be dead. We're going to write Ichabod on it. The Lord has departed. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. Do you know, and I'm not being mean. I'm being as honest as I can be, as transparent as I can be. You know, there's churches all around this community and churches all around the world that you might as well write Ichabod. They don't have nothing to do with the Spirit of God. They're afraid of the Spirit of God. They say the Spirit of God is fake. They don't believe in none of the gifts of the Spirit or anything. You might as well write Ichabod on the 
the church because the Spirit of the Lord has departed. If the Holy Ghost would show up in one of their services, they wouldn't know what to do. I believe if the Holy Ghost showed up like I wanted to show up in this service, some of you wouldn't know what to do. Hallelujah, bring it on. Mess me up. Make me look like a fool. I don't care. Amen. When they walked out on the day of Pentecost, they would look like they was drunk, sagging around, speaking in tongues and everything. And they said, them man, they look like they drunk. And then he said, they ain't drunk. This is 9 o'clock in the morning. We don't drink around here at that time. I wish the police would get called out here and everybody walking out in the parking lot would be so dang drunk we couldn't even drive. We'd have to just lay in our cars. We laugh, but I've seen it in Pensacola, Florida. I've seen the Spirit of God fall in such a way I've never seen before. People couldn't even walk to their car. They had to flicker the lights at 12 o'clock at night to get people to leave the service. You had to get in line at 2.30 in the morning to get in church at 7 o'clock at night. That's a move of God. I was praying a little while ago, and I said, Lord, I'm going to write revival down again, but we don't even know what revival is, Lord. I'm, I'm being open with you. I said, we don't even know what revival is. And the truth is, it ain't going to happen with me. It ain't going to happen unless you do it. I can't orchestrate a revival. If I could, I'd already done it here. Y'all know I've talked about revival ever since I've been here. I can't make revival happen. Revival will never happen in this church unless the Holy Ghost makes it happen. Amen. We're talking about the church. He said, wake up. I believe it's time for us to wake up. I believe he's waking us up. I believe he's stirring. How many of y'all feel a stirring in your spirit like God's doing? Tommy said it Sunday morning. God's doing something different. God's doing something different. Go with it. Don't stop it. If I hear y'all listen to me. If I hear another one of you say, man, I started doing it, but I just couldn't. I'm going to smack you upside your head. Worship the Lord. Praise the Lord. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You ain't going to scare me. And you sure ain't going to scare God. Just make sure you're in order and you ain't drawing attention to yourself all the time. Because if you're drawing attention to yourself, then I'll have to talk to you in a nice way. Just worship the Lord, man. Get free. Hallelujah. Anyway, wake up, strengthen what is left before it dies. He says, you have not done all that my God wants you to do. He, listen to me, church. He didn't say you hadn't done anything. He didn't say you hadn't done anything. He said, you hadn't done all I told you to do. There's a lot of churches, and ours included. We may have done some good things. We may have done a lot of things. But maybe we hadn't done everything he's told us to do. In church, I don't believe we have. I believe we fall into this category right here. I don't believe that we've done everything God's told us to do. We're trying. And we're working towards it. But I believe we've got to do some shaking and baking going on to get to where God's telling us to go. Amen? Are y'all agreeing with me? If you ain't put your dukes up. Spiritually. Time to wake up. Time to be open for whatever God wants to do and how he wants to do it. As long as it lines up with scripture, I'm good. Bring it on. Wake up. He says, wake up. He says, strengthen what is left or to die. He said, you have, done, you have not done all that God wants you to do. So what do we do? Then you repent and you do what God tells you to do. And that's what we're trying to do. Do exactly what God tells you to do. There's not been one thing that I've done here that God told me not to do. Now, I'm not saying I've done everything he told me to do. But I've not done what he's told me to do. If, he's, if, if I feel like God's laid it on my heart to do it, I've done it whether I messed up or not. Whether anybody liked it or not. Good, bad, or ugly, I'm in. Amen? But he's saying, wake up. He's talking to the church. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, so remember. Let me go back up. He says, wake up. He says, he says so remember. Y'all see this right here? I have marked my Bible so much I can't even hardly read it. So remember what you have been taught and have heard and obey it. You know the number one problem in the church today with church people, he's talking to the church, is they don't obey God's word. They hear God's word. A lot of you in here, you know God's word. You know exactly what God's word says to do and you still want to buck it. I hear no amens on that. Amen, preacher. Y'all hear what I'm saying? That's one of the problems that we have. We hear God's word. Trace, I'm probably going to be a little loud, so if I scare, I'm sorry. We hear God's word, but we don't obey God's word. 
You know how many times I've talked about tithing in this church? Now, y'all whinging out of order to be upset or such. Y'all getting all busted and disgusted and mad at me. You know how many times I've talked about tithing? You know how many times I've proved in Scripture that tithing is a godly thing and that you can't outgive God and that there's no way to outgive God and that if you tithe, God said he's going to bless you. didn't say he's just going to give you money. It says he's going to bless you. How many times have I said that? Thousands of times. And how many times do we still have people in our church? Now, I know none of you. But still have people in our church that don't do it. They just don't do it. It's my money. I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to. It's just like being faithful to the house of God. You can't afford not to be faithful to the house of God. Look at how many. Now, I know y'all come on Wednesday night. But look at how many people that used to come on Wednesday nights and never come anymore. And now their marriages are busted up. Or they don't even come to church anymore. That's why it's important to hear the word of God. It's important to be in the house of God. Somebody tells me I'm a Christian, I don't go to church, I question whether or not they're a real Christian. Now I know there's physical things that people go through and different reasons that people can't come to church, but if somebody says they're a Christian, they should want to go to God's house. Amen? And if they say they don't want to go to God's house because it's full of hypocrites, then they ought to be man, and, man of God or woman of God enough to come in and change it. Amen? Get the fire so hot, somebody's got to catch on fire. Hallelujah. Are y'all having as much fun as I am? He says, so remember. He says, remember. God, I can't read. So remember what you have been taught and heard and obey it. And then he goes, he's talking to the church. He says, turn away from your sins. In the seven letters, look how many times he had to say, turn away from your sins, talking to the church, not the world. And we wonder why people don't want to come to church, because the church is messed up more than the world. You don't believe me? Go Google it. Google, di di Google divorce in the world and in the church. We're supposed to have God on our side. God's supposed to be first in our families. We're supposed to listen to him and submit to him. And the husband submit to God and the wife submit to the husband. And we work together. And we, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to be Christians and God-fearing people. The man of God and woman of God. And we got more divorces than the world's got. Wake up, church. It's so easy now just to throw the towel in and go find somebody else. I'll just find somebody else. I'm going to be happy. No, you ain't. The next person you find is going to be a dang goofball idiot, and they're going to treat you worse than the first one did. And you deserve everything you get. Don't get mad at me for saying that. Sometimes it works out beautifully, but I'm just saying if you're a man and woman of God, you're supposed to stay together. Now, I understand that there's times it don't work out. And it's times of the, the, the Bible gives the reason to leave. You can't just leave because you want to leave. But sometimes it happens. And when it does, God will restore and God will give you somebody else better. Hallelujah. I could tell y'all a couple of stories that y'all would laugh like crazy, but it's for real. I've sat in my office with men and I've told them they're hurting. Their wife left them in infidelity and stuff. They had scriptural reasons to divorce. And I said, I promise you, if you take the high road, God will bless you. And the person he gives you will be way better than the first one. And I've had them come up to me and say, boy, you was right. Hallelujah. <laughs> now I know I'm going to get some junk email on that. And that's fine. Be good. <laughs> Just leave your name. Leave your name. If you don't leave your name, I don't even, I'll throw it away. Leave your name. It'll be all right. He says, y'all do know y'all crazy, right? Okay. He says this. He says, hold firmly to it. He says, hold firmly to what you believe. He said, turn away from your sin. Hold firm. He said, if you don't wake up, what a warning he's getting ready to give him. Give them. He says, church, if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief. You won't know when I will come. He says, you won't even know when I'll come to you. He gives the church a warning. He says, wake up. 
Get your junk together, because if you don't, judgment's coming. It's not talking about the end times. He's talking about coming to that church and judging that church. If you remember two, two or three churches over, he told them, I'll come and take the, the candlestick and the lamps, and I'll take the pastor away, and I'll close the church down. You know, it's been said that 3,200 pastors a month, 3,200 pastors a month, Quit the ministry? Wow. 3,200 men that said they were called to preach the gospel get so hurt in the churches and get so frustrated in the churches and they let the devil win in my opinion because if you called, you called. It don't matter what kind of mess you got to go through. I didn't hear amen. And it don't matter what mess you got to go through with me. If you called here, you stuck with me till God moves me. But seriously, 3,200 preachers, 80% of them feel like they have, no, 90% of them feel like they have nobody to confide in or talk to. 80% of them have, have contemplated uh, suicide and different things like that. I can't even comprehend that. I've been through some crazy stuff here, but I, I ain't never felt like that. I felt frustrated, but that's one thing. But I ain't never felt like, and I, I've got, I can look around this room. I got a bunch of people that I can confide in. Now, you may go snitch behind my back, and that's fine, but I can talk to you. No, seriously, I got some, I got people in this church. Some people, they say if you find five friends, or what is it, five or three friends in your life, you've done good. I got way more than that. People that I know I can trust, I can call any time, and they'll be there for me. I don't, I don't feel like these, these people do. And it's sad. It breaks my heart that these men of God try to, if they are trying to preach the word of God and do what's right, that they get so beat down and ridiculed that they, they give up. We need to pray. We need to pray for a move of God in the church. He says, wake up. He said, if you don't, I'm going to come and judge you. I don't want God's judgment on your vision. That's why I've really tried to be sensitive to what God wants us to do so he won't bring his judgment on our church. Y'all do realize that God could bring judgment on his church anytime he wanted to? We, we can think we got this going on and that going on and money coming in or this coming in. He can shut these doors as fast as he opened them. Don't ever get too big for your britches to think that we got it all together. We ain't got it all together. We still striving. We're still trying to wake up everybody. Amen? And then he goes on and he says this. But you have a few. Everybody say few. He said, but you have a few people in Sardis who are pure. God's always going to have a remnant. You know, in every church that I've ever went to, every church I've ever went to, there was always that remnant of people that prayed that believed God, that worked, that served. You always had that remnant of people. And then you always got this other group that they come and they do stuff, but they don't really get involved. But you always have that remnant of people that are just have God's heart and they do whatever they got to do. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen? A lot of you are in here. He said, you got a few people that are living it. And you know what? That's the truth. In, in all churches. I wish, I wish I could stand up here and say as a pastor of New Vision Ministries that I felt like everybody that come through these doors was going to heaven, but I can't say that. Ain't no way I could say that with a clear conscience. I, as I look around, I hope and pray that everybody's going to heaven, but I don't believe that everybody that walks through these doors are going to heaven. I believe they have opportunity to go to heaven. And I believe they hear a message and a, and a worship team that tries to lead them on their way to heaven. But only you can, can make that call. Only you can accept Jesus and go to heaven. He says, wake up, church. He says, there are only a few of you that are pure. He said, they aren't covered with evil, with evil like dirty clothes. They're not co covered with dirty clothes and filthiness and sin. He says, listen to this. They will walk with me dressed in white because they are worthy. We, we're talking about now, we're talking about overcomers. We're supposed to be overcomers. 
We are overcomers. We're not undercomers. We're the head, not the tail. We're the first, not the last. Amen? Amen? Y'all should be learning this stuff. Our identity in Christ, we, we done won. I talked to you about it Sunday. We done won. He says, they will walk with me dressed in white because they are worthy. Here is what I will do for anyone. Look at your neighbor and say, anyone. Who's anyone? Well, if you break down the Hebrew Greek lexicon, anyone is anyone. Wow, I'm a Greek philosopher now. Whatever you call them. He says anyone. 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 This is what I will do for anyone. Not just Billy Graham. Not just all these great preachers and men of God. He says I'll do this for anyone. Anyone is you. He said they will walk in white, dressed in white because they're worthy. He said, here is what I will do for anyone who has victory over sin. He didn't say, I'll do this for people that live in sin. Oh my goodness, I could preach a week on that. It absolutely blows my mind, the teaching that's going out in the world today. Blows my mind. Mind that they won't preach on sin. They won't preach on sin. You'll never hear them preach on sin. And, and, and when they preach, they preach such a happy gospel that they never tell the truth about living in sin. They never tell the truth about how you overcome and how you got to live a life of victory in sin. He didn't say, I'll give this to anybody that confesses me or anybody that goes to church or any of that. He said, I'll give this to anyone that has victory over sin. How do you have victory over sin? You give your life to Jesus Christ, you submit to the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Another problem in the churches is they don't teach a Spirit-filled life. They don't teach how that you can walk in the Spirit and you don't have to sin. We don't have to sin. There's preachers that's going to watch this and hear this. That's going to say, he's fell and bumped his head. We sin every day. Show me that in the Bible. My Bible says, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Does not everything that we read say to flee from sin? It even says to flee from the very appearance of sin. So how can we say that we sin every day? Look, if you sin every day, keep working. But we shouldn't sin every day. We shouldn't go every day and do something we're not supposed to do. We shouldn't. Some of y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Y'all Wednesday night. Y'all done heard this. Amen. He said, I'll give this in white. You know what white represented? Their, their, their city had... They, 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 they had, uh, it's called wool garments. And when they made white garments, those white garments were for parties or special occasions. <laughs> Y'all ain't getting this yet. Jesus said, I'm going to throw a party and I'm going to put you in white so everybody know you with me. Y'all still ain't getting that. Y'all would shout it. If I'd have said y'all was going to put Panther t-shirts on and y'all know I'm with the Panthers and y'all might have got a little excited a little bit. No, Jesus said, I'm going to dress you in white because you're worthy and then I'm going to parade you around everybody because you're going to something special. It's called heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man, that's powerful. And then listen what else he says. He said, I'm going to dress that person in white like those worthy people. He said, I will never erase their names from the book of life. Now listen to me real closely. Some of you are going to get your feathers ruffled, and that's fine. Study, 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 study. If, if it couldn't be erased, why would he even mention that? 
If it couldn't be erased, why did he tell Moses when Moses stood before him and he started pleading with the people? Moses said, God, if you're going to erase their names out of your book, take mine out too. If you go to the Greek, Hebrew, block means to erase. And that's what the word says in the King James to blot out. So why would Jesus have John to write this and say to those that overcome a victory, a life of victory and sin, then I'm going to place them in white. I'm going to let them walk around and parade them around in white. And then I'm going to what? Never erase their names. Those that are worthy. Those that are walking it out. That's what he said. Read it yourself. It blows my mind that people don't see that. Erase means erase. Even in the Hebrew Greek. Blot out, which is what the King James says, means to erase. So if your name could never be erased, why would he say, I'll never erase your name? Study it out. It's all good. I ain't going to fuss with you. He said, I will never erase their names from the book of life. I will, listen to this, this is awesome. He said, I will speak of them by Name. Y'all listening to this? Jesus is talking and he's telling the church all those that have victory over sin, which he's talking about us now. The first, he was talking about those dressed in white that was pure in the church. Now he's talking about everybody that overcomes sin, he's going to dress in white. He said, then I'm going to speak to God. He said, I'm going to speak of them by name to my father and his angels. What? Dad. Dad, you know Vivian? You remember Vivian Taylor? She's, she's one of mine. You see that white dress I've got her? I'm going to parade her around. But, but Dad, I want you to know Vivian Taylor is one of mine. Kevin Blake. Kevin Blake, you remember Kevin, don't you? You remember Kevin, don't you, Dad? You remember that day he come down, give his life to you, he's been serving you? That's Kevin Blake. See him in that white, Dad, don't he look good parading around in that white, going to the party we're going to? Y'all see what I'm saying? Y'all ain't getting excited. He said, I'm going to speak to my Father in your behalf, in your name. Gosh, I'm Moses, hallelujah. I'm going to cut a backflip. I wouldn't break my back, I would. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Jesus said, let me, let me break it down as simple as I can. I want everybody to hear me. Jesus said, those that live a godly life and they walk in victory over sin. He said, I'm going to give them a white dress, gown, clothes, whatever it is. I'm going to dress them in white and I'm going to pray them around. And then I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to talk to him about you in your name. He ain't just going to say, hey, you remember all them people in North Carolina? You remember all them people at New Vision? No, he's going to say, do you remember this person? Do you remember this person? God, do you remember them? Man, that's powerful, y'all. We, that's powerful. Do we even understand? Sometimes I wonder if we, in our little peanut brains, if we can understand all that right there. Because that's really simple. Amen? It's simple. He says, listen. Hold firm to what you believe. Obey my teachings. Do what I've told you to do. And when you do, you're an overcomer. That's what we're talking about is overcomers. Only overcomers. He said, he that overcomes, will I let do this, 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 and this. Are you an overcomer tonight? Are you really an overcomer? Are you alive or do people just look at you and think that you're alive but you're really dead? Are you alive? Are you serving Jesus? Are you living for Jesus? Or are you playing games? Only you can answer that. But the only thing I can say to you is, if you are, wake up. Wake up. It's not too late. He said, strengthen that other before it dies. That little ember you have inside of you. Some of you have been hanging on by a string. 
You've been fighting tooth and nail. You've been fighting tooth and nail. You had not totally surrendered all this stuff that you're going through to Jesus. And you've been fighting tooth and nail. You're hanging on by a string. And Jesus is saying, strengthen that. Let me come in and help you. That's good preaching. I don't care what you say. And then he says this to all the churches. Whoever has ears should listen to what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has spiritual ears to hear. So many come into our services and services all around the world and they don't have spiritual ears. And the Bible says that they're carnal minded and they can't understand the things of God. They come in church, they walk in, they hear a message and they walk out the same way because they're carnal minded and they can't understand the things of God. But that's not who he's talking about here. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about the church. You wouldn't think that Jesus would have to tell the church to put your spiritual ears on and listen. But that's what he's saying. He said, listen, guys, wake up. Wake up. This is no game. This is serious. This is, this is for keeps. Wake up. Get your spiritual ears, your antennas on, and listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Do you know that God still speaks to the church? He's still speaking, but are we listening? Hallelujah. He's still speaking. I'm hard-headed. Man, I'm hard-headed, but he's still speaking. If I don't hear him, it ain't because he ain't speaking. He's always speaking. He's always speaking. We just got to listen. Amen? Wake up. You got stuff in your life, get rid of it. Stop doing it. Be vic- have victory over sin and walk this thing out the way we're supposed to. Amen? Stand with me. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And Jesus, I thank you for sending these letters to the churches. I thank you that we can learn from these letters. And that we can apply them to our church. And Lord, I, I know that there's times you, you shake me. You know, I, I get complacent. I'm no, I'm no different than anybody in this room. I get complacent. You know, sometimes I get frustrated, get in a bad mood. Sometimes I just don't feel it. But Lord, I thank you that you shake us and you have the Holy Spirit to quicken us. Or you have an awesome brother or sister in Christ to come and give us an encouraging word or speak something over us or, or sometimes correct us a little bit. I thank you for all that, God, because what you want to do is you want us to overcome sin. And the only way we can do that is to walk a life of purity before you. You overcame sin. We talked about it Sunday. You overcome sin. You never sinned. And you said you'd give us the power not to sin. So help us, Lord, to walk this thing out. I don't want anybody in here to feel condemnation, thinking, well, I sin every day. I must not be. No, man, it ain't about that. It's a growing process. Just like a baby taking milk, you don't give a baby a steak right off the bat. And God is growing some of you. Some of you are in a process, and God's convicting you and helping you. And as long as you keep following the Holy Spirit, you're going to be fine. It's when we start rebelling and quit even listening is when we get in trouble. And that's what he's saying. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says into the churches. We can live a victorious life over sin. And when we do, he will clothe us in white. He'll talk to the Father in our name. And man, we're going to the biggest hoedown, biggest party, biggest event ever happened when Jesus comes back and he welcomes us into his kingdom. It's going to be on. It's going to be awesome. And it's worth anything we got to go through to make it. Lord, bless your people. I love this church. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the powerful people in this church, the awesome people, workers, servants of God. We have pure people in this church, and I thank you for that, Lord. Lord, bring all of us together in unity. Thank you for what you're doing through the small groups that's going to help do those things. 
Thank you for everything that you're doing in our church, Lord. We don't take it for granted. We thank you for the lives that was touched at this altar Sunday. I pray that you continue to minister to them, that they would continue to follow you, continue to, to start praying and reading their word and, and stay in the house of God. And, Lord, that they would be encouraged and challenged to walk this thing out. We love you and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Love you. And uh, thank you for a good night.